Welcome to the lecture on theories and policies of international trade. After this lecture, we will be able to learn the following objectives. Understand international trade, explain the mercantilism theory of international trade, define theory of absolute advantage, describe the classical theory of international trade, discuss on Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage, explain the Hetzer all Lin trade model, understand Porter's diamond of national advantage, explain the evaluation of Hetzker all Lin theory of international trade, discuss on India's international trade policy. Introduction. Let's start with a brief introduction to the topic, theories and policy of international trade. It would provide an introduction to the core of international trade theory and policy. Attention is paid to the use and relevance of various economic models in explaining international trade and evaluating international trade policy. The main areas that would be covered are the Richardian model of comparative advantage, neoclassical production and trade, factor endowments and trade market structure, imperfect competition and trade theory of trade policy. International trade. Traditionally, international trade consisted of traded goods like textile, food items, spices, precious metals, precious stones and objects of art and various items across the borders. Multinational organizations have emerged through the previous century with footprints all over the globe. Companies no longer limit themselves to local markets, they no longer depend upon local resources. In present scenario, no country can afford to remain isolated from and not participate in globalization. Today, most of the countries are party to several bilateral as well as multilateral traffic and trade agreements like GATT, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, through which they regulate imports and exports to and from specific countries. Merchantilism Theory of International Trade Mercantilism was a 16th century economic philosophy that maintained that a country's wealth was measured by its holdings of gold and silver. This required that the countries to maximize export and minimize import. Logic was transparent to the 16th century policymakers that if foreigners bought more goods from us than we bought from them, then the foreigners had to pay us the difference in gold and silver, enabling us to amass more treasure. Mercatilis pressed for favorable balance of trade BOT or balance of payments BOP as against the unfavorable one. In a way, it is good because currency appreciates with mounting surplus on the forex front and the country was attract more foreign capital infusion, further strengthening the country's economy, infrastructure, etc. Evaluation of Mercantilism Theory Mercantilist writers have been lauded and criticized in the literature on foreign trade at least since Humay's political discourses in 1752. Mercantilists have been criticized for everything from their views regarding the gains from trade to the self-promotion of the merchant's role in society as being important. Theory of New Mercantilism Mercantilism is still in vogue. Mercantilist Policies are politically attractive to some firms and their workers as mercantilism benefits certain members of society. Modern supporters of these policies are known as neo-mercantilists or protectionists. The neo-mercantilists want higher production through full employment and that every industry produces an exportable surplus leading to favorable BOT. Theory of Absolute Advantage the real wealth of the country consists of goods and services available to its citizen. If any country can produce a particular commodity more and more cheaply than other countries, it has an absolute advantage. In this video, we're going to talk about the idea of absolute advantage, and we're going to see it in action. Absolute advantage occurs when one nation can produce a product at lower cost relative to another nation. What this means is using the same amount of resources as land, labor, capital, one producer can produce a good at a cheaper absolute cost than somebody else. What we use to illustrate this is called the two country, two good model. So let's say in the world there are two countries and there are two goods that these countries can produce and consume. 
The two countries we're going to see are France and Germany. They can each produce two good, cheese and sauerkraut. In France, a single worker can produce either five wheels of cheese or two tubs of sauerkraut. In Germany, an equivalent worker using the equivalent resources can produce one wheel of cheese or seven tubs of sauerkraut. So what we've done is we've put what each country can produce in the table here. Now the question is, who can produce cheese at a lower absolute cost? Well, using the same amount of resources, the same level of resources, France can produce five wheels of cheese to Germany's one. In this case, France has an absolute advantage in producing cheese because they can produce more using the same resources. So France has the absolute advantage in cheese. With sauerkraut, France produces two units of sauerkraut and the same resources that Germany uses to produce seven units of sauerkraut. In this example, Germany would have the absolute advantage in sauerkraut because it can produce more using the same resources. So Germany does indeed have the absolute advantage in sauerkraut. Now with absolute advantage what we can do is show that if each country specializes in the good that they are better at producing they can both be better off than if they were producing by themselves. Let's assume that France and Germany don't know that each other exists. They are working in a vacuum by themselves. We know that France could produce five wheels of cheese or two tubs of sauerkraut. Let's assume that France has 50 workers in their country. And France likes both cheese and sauerkraut, so they split their workforce right down the middle. Each good has 25 workers producing them. If that's the case, what is France's total output? Well, knowing that a single worker can make five units of cheese, and we have 25 workers, making five units of cheese apiece, we can find out that they could make 25 times 5, 125 wheels of cheese. In the same boat, they have 25 workers producing sauerkraut. Each worker can produce two sauerkraut. 25 times 2 is 50 sauerkraut. So France, by itself, right now making these assumptions, can produce and consume 125 wheels of cheese, and 50 tubs of sauerkraut. Now let's see what Germany can do using the same assumptions. If we recall they can produce one wheel of cheese or seven tubs of sauerkraut using a worker. With 25 workers on each let's find out what Germany can produce. Knowing that each worker in Germany can only produce one wheel of cheese if we have 25 workers on cheese we will have 25 times 1, 25 cheese. With the sauerkraut, we know that each worker can produce seven tubs of sauerkraut. So if we have 25 workers producing sauerkraut, they can produce 25 times 7, 175 tubs of sauerkraut. So here we see what Germany can produce and consume working in a vacuum all by themselves. Well, all of a sudden, France and Germany say, hey, there's some other type of people over there. I wonder what they're like. And after some time, they find out that, hey, France does indeed have an advantage when they produce cheese. They can make more of it. Maybe it's even a little bit better. France also realizes that, hey, Germany can make some mean sauerkraut. And they can do a lot. They can make a lot of sauerkraut. And some of their smartest, most economical minds think to, and say, well, how about if we in France just produce cheese and you in Germany just produce sauerkraut. I think we could find a way to both be better off. So let's see what happens if France puts 50 workers on cheese and Germany puts 50 workers on sauerkraut. With France we know that each worker can produce five wheels of cheese. Five times 50 is 250 cheese. 
We know that in Germany, each worker can produce seven tubs of sauerkraut. Seven times 50 is 350 sauerkraut. The question we should pose to ourselves, is there more cheese and sauerkraut in the world than existed before they decided to specialize in trade? In France, they produced 125 wheels of cheese. In Germany, 25 wheels of cheese. For a total in the world of 150 wheels of cheese. If France specializes, do we have more cheese in the world? Yes, 250 is greater than 150. On the other side, sauerkraut. France produced 50 tubs of sauerkraut. Germany produced 175. Together that would be 225 tubs of sauerkraut. If Germany specializes, they can produce 350 tubs of sauerkraut. Is that more than 225? Yes. Yes it is. So what we can see is, so far, absolute advantage tells us that we can specialize in a, what we have an absolute advantage in and produce a greater amount of these two goods. Now, let's see if France and Germany can truly be better off if they specialize in trade. So here we see again what France is producing and what Germany is producing. Now that we've specialized in what we produce, we should be able to trade and be able to consume a greater amount of cheese and sauerkraut than we did before. France says to themselves, well, before we specialized, we consumed 125 wheels of cheese and 50 tubs of sauerkraut. So we want to at least be able to consume more cheese and sauerkraut than we did originally. So we're willing to trade 100 and cheese to Germany. Germany says, you know what, we used to be able to produce and consume 175 tubs of sauerkraut. We would like to be able to consume more than that. So we want to at least be able to consume 200 tubs of sauerkraut. So we're willing to trade up to 150 tubs of ours. If they do this, will both countries be made better off? We can see that after trade, France will consume 150 wheels of cheese, 150 tubs of sauerkraut. Germany will consume 100 wheels of cheese and 200 tubs of sauerkraut. Are they consuming at a greater amount of both cheese and sauerkraut than they were before? If we think back, 25 workers on cheese and 25 workers on sauerkraut in France produced 125 cheese and 50 sauerkraut. They are indeed consuming at a greater level than they did before. But how about Germany? We know that they were able to produce and consume 25 wheels of cheese and 175 tubs of sauerkraut. Are they producing more and being able to consume more? Absolutely. So what we've just illustrated is with absolute advantage we can specialize in a good, produce a greater amount, and trade our excess to be better off. Remember, countries, people, anyone will voluntarily trade as long as they are made better off because of it. Natural advantages, climate, area, resources, principle of absolute advantage. To vividly illustrate the principle of absolute advantage, suppose that there are two countries, USA and Japan, producing two goods, food and cars, using labor as the only input. Complication and limitation. There are several caveats in the above analysis, some of which we discuss now. Absence of absolute advantage. It is frequently argued that developing countries may like the technology to gain an absolute advantage in the production of any good such that they cannot possibly compete on the global market and benefit from free trade. More factors of production. In reality, goods are produced using several factors of production simultaneously such as capital, land, 
and various types of labor. Usually goods then cannot be ranked according to absolute advantage as their production is one country requires more of one input and simultaneously less of another input than in another country. Absolute advantage, income and wages. Daniel Treffler systematically analyzes these issues by combining the Hesher or Lint model with technology differences while taking into consideration the empirically observed home country bias, a consumer preference for domestically produced goods over otherwise identical imports. Classical theory of international trade. According to the classical theory of international trade, every country will produce their commodities for the production of which it is most suited in terms of its natural endowments, climate equality of soil, means of transport, capital, etc. Types of cost difference in production. Economists speak about three types of cost difference in production. They are absolute cost difference. Adam Smith in his book, Wealth of Nation argued that international trade is advantageous for all the participating countries only if they enjoy absolute differences in the cost of production of the commodity which they specialize. Equal cost difference. Adam Smith, in order to strengthen his argument in favor of absolute difference in cost, pointed out that trade is not possible if countries operate under equal difference in cost instead of absolute difference. In international trade, we're going to talk about the theory of comparative advantage. Okay, we have a hypothetical world where only two countries exist. Two countries creatively named A and B. Okay? And in these two countries, there are only two, two items, two products, ice cream and freezers. Strange world, but a cool world, pardon the pun. Okay, in the course of a given day, if A were to focus all of its energies on ice cream, it could produce 80 barrels, okay? B, focusing all of its attention on ice cream, produces 20, okay? A, focusing on nothing but freezers, they can make 20 freezers in a day. B, can actually make as many freezers as it does ice cream. Well, of course, you need both, right? I mean, you can't have ice cream without freezers. Not for very long, anyway. Um, and so what they do is they divide their time. They divide their resources in the course of the day, meaning A is going to split the time evenly and spend half of its day on ice cream and half of its day on freezers. B is going to do the same. And then we take a look and you say, well, A has obviously has a, an absolute advantage over B in terms of the production of ice cream, and it's a tie when it comes to freezers. But when you dig a little deeper, you realize something. You say, hey, no, wait a minute. For A to produce a freezer, they have to give up the production of four ice creams, right? Or the cost of a freezer is four ice creams, whereas for B to produce a freezer, they only give up one ice cream. So in those terms, B is actually the more efficient producer, substantially so, of freezers. Okay? Ah, so now we have an opportunity for trade, don't we? Because if A and B got together, and A realized, or they both realized that, you know what? B is a lot better at freezers. A is a lot better at ice cream. So if A just focuses all of its time on ice cream, B on freezers, then we can do some trade and both be better off in the process. See, because now A can actually give, let's say, 15 ice creams in exchange for 10 freezers. So the 15 from the 80 leaves them with 65 ice cream. This leaves them with 10 freezers. And at the end of the day, guess what? We're better off. Before we got together and before we traded, uh, A had 40 ice creams. Today it has 65. And it still has just as many freezers. Uh, B had 10 ice creams. It has 50% more. And it has just as many freezers as well. Folks, that is the beauty of international free trade. Okay? Now, on that topic, this morning I read an article in the New York Times that, that talked about solar panel manufacturers in China um, being accused by seven companies that manufacture solar panels here in the U.S. of uh, China subsidizing, they're, they're bringing it in cheap. U.S. consumers then can buy this Chinese product lots, or much less expensively than they can buy the, uh, the U.S. product. 
somehow that's a bad thing. It's a bad thing if you're one of the manufacturers. So they filed a case this Wednesday. And by the way, today is October 21st, 2011. It's a Friday. So the day before yesterday, they filed this case. And, um, and, and they actually, the, the author of the article believes that they'll probably win, and there'll probably be tariffs placed on these solar panels uh, coming from China. Okay, here's the problem. Uh, Chinese manufacturers and, and certain U.S. companies ha have realized some comparative advantage because what's been happening is there are companies here in the U.S. that manufacture solar panel manufacturing equipment and China's been buying a billion dollars worth of that a year from the U.S. They've also been buying a billion dollars worth of the raw materials that go into these solar panels from other U.S. companies. Uh, if we apply the tariff, China is, is ready to go to Germany and buy the, um, the solar panel equipment from Germany and, and therefore killing the business of those manufacturers here in the U.S. So folks, this is going to be another example of the government getting involved and picking winners and losers. Yeah, they'll, they'll apply the tariffs. No doubt that'll be good for these seven manufacturers. Bad for the rest of these other manufacturers that I just mentioned and also bad for the consumer because now they're paying more than they, would, than they were when the uh, when these advantages that each country had each country had to offer the other um, in terms of the manufacturing and the distribution of these solar panels, and in my next video we're going to drill down even deeper on the whole tariff protectionism topic. Thank you for watching. Hey, again, one more thing. I thought I, I thought I'd expand just a little bit on my on my comparative advantage presentation. Um, again, in in that particular example, A had a comparative advantage when it came to ice cream. B when it came to freezers, and again, by, by combining their forces, they were able to produce more for both in terms of the ice cream. My, uh, my parting comments on the solar panel issue with China, I thought, I thought I'd play devil's advocate a little bit just here for a second and, and, and talk about both arguments, both the protectionist argument and the free trader argument. Because again, I, I've given you the free trader argument, and that is that if we tariff this product, it will create business for the selected American industry, if you will. It'll hurt the business, in my example, of the, of the firms that supply equipment and raw materials to China. Now, the protectionists would jump in and say, you know, that, that's, that's not right, because obviously the business is going to increase for these American producers. Therefore, the demand from them for raw materials and equipment over here will expand. So these companies will be fine, but instead of sending their stuff to China, they'll be keeping it here in the U.S. Well, the obvious argument uh, in rebuttal of that is, um, well, the tariff raises the price in China uh, to what the American producer can actually produce it at profitably. And, uh, and therefore, consumers are going to, you're going to take consumers out of the market with this much higher price. So, so the, the end result is the world's going to have fewer solar panels, or at least America is, because the people aren't going to be able to afford as many as they would if we were still importing it from China. So while maybe they'll do, and certainly maybe they would do more business in the U.S., they're going to do substantially less than they would with the Chinese company. And by the way, the tariff that we're looking at is 100% is or over 100%, so we're talking about doubling the price uh, if you wanted to buy the product from China. Now, um, now, another argument would be that, well, China could very well bring production into the U.S. and actually make solar panels here. And in fact, I do believe they're looking at that. In fact, there is some of that going on already in the U.S. And the reason they would do that in the event of a, of a tariff is actually if they come to the U.S., they basically jump, jump over here, produce it here, and then sell it here. And, and in, that re, in that respect, they would be avoiding the tariff altogether. Now the uh, protectionists would say, well, then what are you whining about? Well, again, what the, what the free marketer, so to speak, or the free market advocate would say is that, well, that's great, and that'll actually produce perhaps some, some U.S. jobs, albeit maybe blue-collar jobs, but jobs nonetheless. Uh, still, it's not the most efficient uh, place for them to provide the product. If, if, they, if it was, they'd be here already. If they jump over here because of government involvement, uh, it's better than them going to Germany and buying the equipment there and not supplying the U.S. at all. But still, it is, it is less uh, of a benefit than just free, open trade with China. Ricciardo's theory of comparative advantage. David Ricciardo stated a theory that other things being equal, a country tends to specialize in and export those commodities in the production of which it has maximum comparative cost advantage or minimum comparative disadvantage. Similarly, the country's imports will be of goods having relatively 
less comparative cost advantage or greater disadvantage. Richardo's assumption. Richardo explained his theory with the help of following assumption. There are two countries and two commodities. There is a perfect competition both in commodity and factor market. Cost of production is expressed in terms of labor, that is, value of a commodity is measured in terms of labor, hours or days required to produce it. Commodities are also exchanged in the basic of labor content of each good. Labor is the only factor of production other than natural resources. Labor is homogeneous, that is, identical in efficiency in a particular country. Labor is perfectly mobile within a country, but perfectly immobile between countries. There is free trade, that is, the movement of goods between countries is not hindered by any restriction. Production is subject to constant returns to scale. There is no technological change. Trade between two countries takes place on barter system. Full employment exists in both countries. There is no transport cost. Hexture All-In Trade Model the Hester Olin H O Hereafter model was first conceived by two Swedish economists, Eli Hester and Bertin Olin. Rudimentary concepts were further developed and added later by Paul Samuelson and Ronald Jones, among others. There are four major components of the H O model: Factor Price Equalization Theorem, Stolper Samuelson Theorem, Ribzinski Theorem, and Hester. All-in Trade Theorem Factor Price Equalization Theorem Among the four main results of the HO theory, FPE is the most fragile theorem. If any of the eight assumptions is violated, it will not hold. Porter's Diamond of National Advantage Classical theories of international trade propose that comparative advantage resides in the factors endowments that a country may be fortunate enough to inherit. Factor endowments include land, natural resources, labor, and the size of the local population. Michael E. Porter argued that a nation can create new advanced factor endowments such as skilled labor, a strong technology, and knowledge base, government support, and culture. Porter used a diamond-shaped diagram as the basic of a framework to illustrate the determinants of national advantage. Porter's Diamond of National Advantage Chart the individual points of the diamond and the diamond as a whole effect for ingredients that lead to a national comparative advantage. These ingredients are the availability of resources and skills, information that firms use to decide which opportunities to pursue with those resources and skills, the goals of individuals in companies, the pressure on companies to innovate and invest, factor condition. A country creates its own important factors such as skill resources and technological base. The stock of factors at a given time is less important than the extent that they are upgraded and deployed. Local disadvantages in factors of production force innovation. Adverse condition, demand condition. When the market for a particular product is larger locally than in foreign markets, the local firms devote more attention to that product then do foreign firms leading to a competitive advantage when the local firms begin exporting the product. A more demanding local market leads to national advantage. A strong trend-setting local market helps local firms anticipate global trends. Evaluation of Hedger all in theory of international trade. A significant difference between the classical and the modern approach is that former consisted primarily of propositions about the relative price of goods, the later offers a series of propositions about the relative prices of factors. It also appears that the classical theory was an attempt at establishing the welfare position of trade theory. It stressed that territorial specialization based on comparative advantage leads to an increase in the welfare of the world as a whole. On the other hand, Hatcher Olin theory makes a positive contribution to economics. It makes a scientific attempt to explain the structure of international trade and reveals the ultimate base of international trade as the differences in factor endowment in different regions. The factor proportion theorem of Olin also reveals the classical lacuna of placing emphasis on the equality of a single factor, labor as playing a key role in determining comparative advantage. 
In the Richardian model, comparative cost differences are viewed under the assumption that identical absolute combination of the factors devoted to the production of a single good would produce different amounts of that good in different countries. On the other hand, the old lenient model assumed that the production function of a given commodity is identical from country to country, but it varies from commodity to commodities. India's International Trade Policy Although India has steadily opened up its economy, its tariffs continue to be high when compared with other countries and its investment norms are still restrictive. Average non-agricultural tariffs have fallen below 15%. Quantitative restrictions on imports have been eliminated and foreign investment norms have been relaxed for a number of sectors. Agricultural tariffs average between 30 to 40%. Anti-dumping measures have been liberally used to protect trade and the countries among the few in the world that continue to ban foreign investment in retail trade. India is now aggressively pushing for a more liberal global trade regime and have assumed a leadership role among developing nations in global trade negotiation and played a critical part in the Doha negotiation. Reasonable and bilateral trade agreement. India has recently signed trade agreements with its neighbor and is seeking new ones with the East Asian countries and the United States. Its regional and bilateral trade agreements or variants of them are at different stages of development. Trade agreements with Bangladesh, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, Maldives, China and South Korea. India-Nepal Trade Treaty Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement CECE with Singapore. Framework agreements with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, Thailand and SAIL. Preferential trade agreements with Afghanistan, Child and Mercosur. The latter is a trading zone between Brazil, Argentina, Aragua and Paraguay. World Bank Involvement as a number of research institutions in the country provide the government with good, just-in-time and low-cost analytical advice on trade-related issues, the World Bank has focused on providing analysis on specialized subjects at the government's request. In the last three years, the bank has been working with the Ministry of Commerce in a participatory manner to help the country develop an informed strategy for domestic reform and international negotiation. Given the sensitivity of trade policy and negotiation issues, the bank role has been confined to providing better information and analysis than was previously available to India's policy makers. Summary. Now in the end, let us summarize what we have learned in this lecture. International trades between countries and across continents have existed for centuries including previous civilization. Technology in terms of communication as well as software technology has changed the way business organization manage activities, be it manufacturing, procurement, finance or sales. Managing international trade as multi-dimensional expect which need to be considered by each country. In reality, goods are produced using several factors of production simultaneously such as capital, land and various types of labor. Classical theories of international trade propose that comparative advantage reside in a factor endowment that a country may be fortunate enough to inherit.